Hi everyone, welcome to this beauty class on society, politics and transcendence. My name is Mina Salami and I am an author, a feminist theorist and a researcher. I'm the founder of a blog called Ms. Afropolitan, which sits in between the intersections of feminism, Pan-Africanism, Black studies, philosophy, social criticism and popular culture. And most recently, I'm the author of a book titled Sensuous Knowledge, A Black Feminist Approach for Everyone, which is a collection of interwoven essays about universal topics uh, such as power, identity, knowledge and art um, that together form a kind of uh, pragmatic utopian manifesto of sorts. Um, I'm so thrilled to see all of you here. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I'm also delighted to be part of the Cooper Gallery's uh, Ignorant Art School and one of the five sit-ins that the Cooper Gallery is hosting uh, uh, that, that, that uh, aim toward creative emancipation. So it's really an honor and a delight to be here today. And I hope that you'll all um, enjoy this coming hour. This event is driven by the question, if the understandings that women held about beauty had the same historical significance and public present, presence that those of men and patriarchal institutions do, how would we think of beauty? In what ways would beauty be encoded into cultural, social, and political life? We cannot know because it is men's ideas and thoughts and arguments and values and beliefs and attitudes and preoccupations with beauty that have historically dominated our aesthetic, political and cultural thoughts. But during this event, we'll at least start to explore what kind of different reality might emerge if women were the ones defining beauty. I don't only believe that such a different reality is possible, I think it is an absolute necessity. So just to tell you how the event is gonna proceed, um, we're gonna start by watching a short film together. It's about 10 minutes long, and it is by the British born Ghanaian director, Sam Kessie, who's now based in California. And after that, I'm gonna give a short talk and then we'll have some time for some short group discussions before we ultimately all gather together again for, for a discussion. Um, but before we watch the film, Alison Scott from the Cooper Gallery is just gonna run us through some of the housekeeping. Great, thanks Minna. So yeah, just some really quick housekeeping on a practical level for tonight. So um, myself, Alison Scott, Eileen Daly, Sophia Howe, Peter Imur, um, we will all be on hand tonight as moderators to support the smooth running of this event, a beauty class. So um, in the spirit of open learning and discussion, we also have a code of conduct for Cooper Gallery that you should have received when you booked onto tonight's event. Um, we encourage you just to have a quick look at this and we'll post it again in the chat for your reference. And in case of any issues or concerns you might have during the event, please contact Eileen via private message in the chat box in the first instance, and then we can help you from there. And just to let you know, we're recording this event, so please put your cameras off if you wish to opt out of that recording. Um, and we're also suggesting that participants add their pronouns to their Zoom name if you like um, for the discussion, this can be helpful. And lastly, auto caption subtitles are available tonight uh, via author.ai and the instructions to use these will be posted in the chat just now. And uh, back to Nina, that's all the housekeeping, thanks. Right, so we're gonna start by watching the film and um, the film is really, uh, it's, it's going to help set the tone for the discussions that will follow. So let's go ahead with that. Love takes off the mass that we fear we can't live without and know we can't live within. I use the word love here, Baldwin writes, not merely in the personal sense, but as a state of being or a state of grace, not in the infantile American sense of being made happy, but in the tough and universal sense of quest and daring and growth.
had racism so dehumanize black folks that we were incapable of love. In the diaspora, most black people's relationship to love has been shaped by the trauma of abandonment. Whether we take as the foundation of our psychohistory, the African explorers who came to the so-called New World before Columbus, the free individuals who came in small numbers as immigrants, or the large population of black people who were enslaved and brought here against their will, this is an emotional backdrop full of the drama of union and reunion of loss and abandonment. Since our leaders and scholars agree that one measure of the crisis black people are experiencing is lovelessness, it should be evident that we need a body of literature, both sociological and psychological of work, addressing the issue of love among black people, its relevance to political struggle, its meaning in our private lives. Every black person knows individuals in the communities of their upbringing who were abandoned by biological mothers and fathers and raised by caring kin. Often caring kin do not give to their adopted children necessary emotional care, even though they provide shelter and meet material needs. Sustained loving care is needed to help heal the pain of emotional abandonment. Throughout our history in this nation, black people have tried to deny this pain to act as though it does not affect our capacity to trust. Without trust, there can be no genuine intimacy and love. Yet for those among us who have been abandoned, it is difficult, if not downright impossible, to trust. To move toward love, we must confront the pain of abandonment and loss. This means speaking what may have once been unspeakable. When I was a child, it was clear to me that life was not worth living if we didn't know love. I wish I could testify that I came to this awareness because of the love I felt in my life. But it was love's absence that let me know how much love mattered. I was my father's first daughter. At the moment of my birth, I was looked upon with loving kindness, cherished, and made to feel wanted on this earth and in my home. To this day, I can't remember when the feeling of being loved left me. I just know that one day I was no longer precious. Those who had initially loved me well turned away. The absence of their recognition and regard pierced my heart and left me with a feeling of brokenheartedness so profound I was spellbound. Grief and sadness overwhelmed me. I didn't know what I had done wrong and nothing I tried made it right. Love is profoundly political. 
Our deepest revolution will come when we understand this truth. Only love can give us the strength to go forward in the midst of heartache and misery. Only love can give us the power to reconcile, to redeem, the power to renew weary spirits and save lost souls. The transformative power of love is the foundation of all meaningful social change. Without love, our lives are without meaning. Love is the heart of the matter. When all else has fallen away, love sustains. So that's why our culture of domination does not wish us to know love. Because if we have love, we have that power to stand and to rise above all of the circumstances that are crushing to the spirit and to still see our beauty, to still dance in a circle of love that we create for ourselves. We all long for loving community. It enhances life. But many of us seek community solely to escape the fear of being alone. Knowing how to be solitary is central to the art of loving. When we can be alone, we can be with others. No other connection healed the hurt of that first abandonment, that first banishment from love's paradise. For years, I lived my life suspended, trapped by the past, unable to move into the future. Like every wounded child, I just wanted to turn back time and be in that paradise again, in that moment of remembered rapture where I felt loved, where I felt a sense of belonging. When I leave this moment, I'm going to leave this behind. When I go up to my room, I'm going to restore my soul. I'm going to bring forth the beauty, the grace, what I need. I am not going to be there in bondage to whatever happened to me. We have to begin to reclaim our own agency. The more I reclaim my own agency through the recognition of my power to love, both myself and others, the less I am afraid in any setting because the more I believe that I can draw to me that which is good in my life. So um, thank you for watching that. So there are five things that I want to convey during this talk. The first is that although the history of beauty is entangled with patriarchy, heteronormativity, which is the positioning of heterosexuality as the norm, 
classism and white supremacy, beauty is nevertheless too important a notion to give away entirely. The second thing is that the patriarch patriarchal institutions um, don't want women to define beauty for ourselves. And so defining or redefining beauty is a counter patriarchal strategy. Thirdly, I wanna convey this idea of doing beauty rather than beholding beauty. And fourthly, I wanna kind of, in my, in my book, In Sensuous Knowledge, I, I, I distinguish between three different types of beauty, which I call political beauty, artificial beauty, and genuine beauty. And even though I won't be able to go in depth into each of those, um, they kind of also give a framing of sorts to the talk. And last, um, I'm gonna argue that beauty is something like non-conforming and anarchic. So on that note, the thing is that there can be no beauty in an oppressive system. Whatever is beautiful in the dominant system is beautiful despite and not because of it. So whether, it if, whether you think of a, a meadow that is um, defying environmental destruction or a peacock that is flaring its colorful plumage or a woman who is feeling lovely and confident. Everything beautiful exists in defiance of the oppressive framework that is Europatriarchy. I refer to the framework in which uh, Eurocentric values and patriarchal values dominate as Europatriarchy. In the song, The Rose That Grew from Concrete, the rapper Tupac Shakur spoke about a rose defying nature by growing from a crack in the pavement. Beauty in an oppressive system is like that. It proves the system wrong. It stands in stark contrast to the ugliness of the social order. Yet beauty cannot be defined straightforwardly as something positive anyway. Because beauty as we know it is of course too entangled in repressive patriarchal causes and hence it is inescapably uh, contradictory of the, the kind of positive purposes that beauty could mean. So first of all, beauty is tied to elitism. The, 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 field, uh, the branch of philosophy which studies beauty, which is called aesthetics, um, has since its founding in the 18th century been connected to the, the pleasures of the most privileged groups in society, to high art, to luxury travel, to fine dining and jet setting and things like that. Um, and so it, and it has excluded not only the disenfranchised in society, but also women and people of color. Similarly, beauty is tied to moral values as defined by a small group of people, often within a religious or a spiritual context. The notion of beauty as connected to moral beliefs is found across many cultures in the world. So for example, for the Yoruba, which is where my lineage comes from in, in Nigeria, the word for beauty is ewa, and ewa also forms the basis of, uh, of the aesthetic concept iwalewa, which connotes that good character and uh, sort of moral uprightness are synonymous with beauty. In Sanskrit, there's a, a similar concept uh, called rasa, which was defined by the Indian sage Bharata and has later been expounded upon by philosophers and mystics. And it describes um, beauty as a, as a state of consciousness in which one experiences visuddha sattva, um, which means freedom from egotism. Now, there's nothing wrong with these kinds of connections to beauty and morality and spirituality even except that women have historically been excluded from the kind of the most powerful and meaningful positions within spiritual and religious life. And of course, beauty is a tool 
used to subjugate women. It's probably the key tool. Men are typically not judged by beauty. Women are beautiful and men are handsome. Women are objects of beauty while men analyze beauty. Tellingly, there is no political and megalomaniac consumerism uh, around handsomeness as there is on female beauty. Your patriarchal artists and poets and philosophers have all had opinions about female beauty and not about male handsomeness. This is of course convenient because if the female body is seen as inherently somehow more beautiful than the male body, then it is of course more natural to objectify it or that's how the, the circular Europatriarchal logic goes. So across um, the European history, notable artists like um, Hans Baldung and Gustav Klimt have depicted female beauty in a very kind of stereotype normative way, uh, usually as having long flowing blonde hair and fair skin, an hourglass figure, youthfulness, uh, a seductive look in the object's eyes. Um, so very rigid notions of, of beauty that suit heteronormative male fantasies. We continue to see these replicated in modern society, although now there's more inclusivity um, within these norms. So artists like Beyonce and Zoe Kravitz have played on this image of the, the, the golden tresses and the seductive looks. Um, there's an image of Zoe Kravitz uh, in Rolling Stone magazine inviting into the forbidden fruit. So it's like playing to this image of, of Eve who, of course, um, Eve is the, the, the kind of archetype female beauty epitome that many male artists have depicted throughout history. And this is not a fault of the artists themselves. Um, it is part of this political agenda that we're all enmeshed in. And these images are also often very beautiful, both the historical and the contemporary ones. They're, they're, they're you know, expertly put together. They are very um, beautiful people in them and all of that. Um, but they are connected to rigid stereotypes and to a political agenda. And this is a political agenda that connects male desire to power and female desire to submissiveness. So to put it differently, it's an, it's an agenda that makes oppression seem desirable for women. If only women can acquire beauty or these very specific Europatriarchal ideals of beauty and therein the, the erotic desire that it awakens in men, only then can women access power. That's the political agenda. So whatever else women may achieve, whether they lead successful countries or they end wars or they cure illnesses, it pales in comparison to the, to the, the, the erotic power that they can amass through the rigid definitions of beauty. The political agenda of beauty does not only eroticize women's oppression, but it also upholds specific attributes of uh, white women as global standards of beauty. Also, it solidifies the idea that heterosexuality is the norm because it's only really within a heteronormative culture that beauty can be used as a tool to oppress women. If, if heterosexual relationships and traditional gender roles were not privileged by the cultural and sociopolitical system, then the entire conceptualization of beauty that we know would be turned on its head because beauty ideals would be disentangled from male desire and power. Because of all this, there are numerous feminist critiques of beauty and how beauty culture harms girls and women. There are theories about um, the male gaze. There are, uh, there's a lot of analysis and theories about colorism. 
Um, lots of studies have been conducted about how, um, ex to, about the extreme measures that women um, go through in order to, to meet these beauty ideals. So by starving themselves or uh, engaging in risky surgical procedures and that kind of thing. Without doubt, beauty is a, a, a harmful notion in many ways, in, in the way that we think of it contemporarily. Yet, what I want to argue is that despite the political agendas that are tied to beauty, beauty is too important a notion to give away. I'm interested not so much in what beauty is, but rather in what beauty does. What is the function of beauty in society, in culture, in religion, in politics, epistemically, emotionally? What role does beauty play? And if beauty plays a role um, today, as it does, then that means it could play a different role. That means it could potentially be part of defining a different reality. I think that we need to detach our ideas of beauty from heteronormativity, patriarchy, racism, classism, speciesism, and redefine beauty from a woman-centered feminist point of view. We need to explore beauty from an active rather than a passive position of womanhood. So as subjects rather than as objects. It's kind of like playing the, the, the role of the director of the orchestra rather than the instruments in the orchestra. And even though the song, the instruments might be the same, the song might sound similar, but there will be a, a, a subtle but really strong difference. In the film, we heard Bell Hook say that love is profoundly political because she argues, she narrates uh, rather, that love can aid for meaningful social change. I believe that beauty can do the same. Toni Morrison wrote in her novel, The Bluest Eye, that beauty was not simply something to behold, but something one could do. I want to reflect on what it means to do beauty and how beauty can help us when it comes to individual and collective social transformation. Feminism is an anti-patriarchal movement. So if the function of beauty in patriarchy is to use beauty to objectify women, and to encourage consumerism and to create hierarchical class structures uh, based on race and ethnicity and religion and sexuality, then the function of feminists is to, or of beauty to feminists, is to reverse that. But by doing beauty, I don't just mean being anti-patriarchal in this way and because that can kind of relegate us to perpetually um, responding to patriarchy. So what I mean by doing beauty is what Bell Hooks, um, as she puts it in the film, to restore our souls. So the motivation goes beyond transcending Europatriarchy and redefining beauty norms aesthetically because as necessary as, as that is, um, and is certainly something that feminists should continue to encourage, the thing is it still focuses on the aesthetic. In sensuous knowledge, I, um, I argue that, the, or the kind of the key premise of what I refer to as Europatriarchal knowledge is it is, a t it is an approach to knowledge which creates a distinction between the aesthetic and the political. So it sees the, the political as being um, things like analysis and facts and science and uh, technology. And then the aesthetic is things that are to do with the arts and embodiment and the non-human natural world. 
and Europatriarchal systems um, create a sharp distinction between these two in order to be able to manipulate and control them. And instead, what sensuous knowledge is about is it's about interweaving the political and the aesthetical and creating a, a synthesis of political aesthetic thought and behavioral patterns. I am arguing that beauty is generative for sociopolitical culture. And the film shows this so well, I think, by juxtaposing different types of settings. So you have the rural, natural, open, um, really refreshing kind of landscape um, juxtaposed with city life. And um, I know from having watched interviews with the director and also having spoken with the director, who's, who's a friend of mine, um, that which is some, a context that you might not all have picked up on first viewing, but the, the character in the film is an, she's an alien uh, in a new land and she's sort of trying to find her home. Um, and I find that part where she, in the very end, where she plants a kola nut, a kola nut is a, is a fruit typically found in Africa. Um, and she's now in America and she plants the kola nut in the soil. Um, and it, it's almost as if the soil and the soul are the same thing. And by uh, burying an object that she finds so beautiful and meaningful into the soil, that is the way that she can become whole in her new environment. In that same way, when we mold a feminist ecology of beauty uh, with ourselves at the center, with, with what the feminist philosopher Sandra Harding calls socially situated knowledge, by which she means that we place our, uh, our, our lived experiences um, at the center and look at the world from there, instead of by um, placing abstract knowledge of the oppressor at the center. If we do that, then what is beauty? And for me, although I would ultimately say that the very beauty of beauty is that it is something undefinable and slippery. Uh, the moment we start to want to define beauty dogmatically, it, it loses its preciousness. But nevertheless, what emerges for me when viewed from this woman-centered feminist perspective is non-conformity. Beauty is something that is non-conformist, uninstitutionalized. Beauty is not democratic. We can't vote and create a consensus on beauty, which is something that even uh, progressives try to do uh, to some extent. Um, but the problem is that this is what patriarchal norms have always done. So uh, your patriarchal thought is always seeking to enforce uh, mechanical thinking. And so even if, if the thinking is progressive, once we uh, machinize it, I don't know if that's a word, but let's go with that, um, then, then we're sort of replicating a same pattern of thought. So the true freedom lies in escaping from authority and for beauty to guide us to beauty, it is anarchic more so than democratic. It's everything that doesn't follow rules like Tupac's rose emerging from the, from the concrete. And speaking of Tupac, uh, hip hop is uh, something that is a, is a genre of music uh, that's whose beauty lies in non-conformity. So hip hop takes something that uh, is typically thought of as, as ugly and unattractive, which is rage and anger and transforms it into something beautiful. Another reason that beauty is non-conformist is because the, the whole history of male thinking around beauty is to make it conform. Um, male thinkers have tried to to measure beauty even. So there's these theories like the golden ratio, which you might be familiar with because about once a year, um, we're told that the most beautiful woman in the world is 
this or that person. And usually the way that that's been uh, decided is through this golden ratio, which, you know, it has a formula. It's like 3.14 on some scale somewhere. Um, there's William Hogarth's theory of the, the line of beauty. Um, Immanuel Kant uh, created distinctions between the sublime and the beautiful, um, which he contrasted um, by trying to measure the natural world versus female beauty. Um, there's all these theories and it's, it's really absurd when you think about it, that something as, as freeing and wild and unleashed as beauty um, is turned into something so robotic and soulless. From a woman-centered feminist perspective, the role that beauty plays is something more imminent, sociopolitical, it's something more inclusive and pluralistic. Um, it has to do with lived experience and nature and matter, and it engages the earth, the body, rituals, holisticism. Um, and when you look at uh, feminist traditions and particularly those of, of black women who have been excluded for so long, were excluded from conventional ways of, of power, um, they used the arts and the body and, and uh, the, the kind of aesthetic realms to create knowledge. In the film, um, the character walks contemplatingly. She's somewhat hesitant. Um, she's, she's holding this kola nod, which I use as a, find as a metaphor for her soul. Um, she's holding it in her fist and close to her heart. And she's walking through this ghostly, misaligned environment of sorts. It's as though she's seeking to situate herself in this new environment. Finding beauty is kind of like that. It's situating yourself in an environment that tries to destroy you. It's being rooted and, and looking at the world from your own point of view with clarity rather than the oppressive uh, perspective that you've been educated to look at the world from. And it is exploring these things individually and collectively. So despite the, con the contentious baggage that's carried by historical and contemporary meanings of beauty, um, beauty I think is a notion with generative, reinventive and explorative potential for social transformation. What would change if we seriously thought about how to beautify the crises of society, the ecological crises, the political, cultural, and so on? Could beauty help us to propagate love, imaginativeness, conscientious politics with the non-human natural world, with others, with the cosmos, as well as with science and philosophy and theories? I think that maybe it could. I think that if beauty is this non-conforming, anarchic, wild, rebellious understanding um, of a notion, then at least it's worth exploring what social and political value it has. So that's um, where I'm gonna end. And that's what I want you to do now in, um, in, in groups is to explore these questions um, as well as any of the other points that were raised in the film or in my talk. Um, so you're going to have the option to join um, breakout rooms. And I'm gonna pop the questions into the chat and we'll have 10 minutes to, um, to discuss them. And then we'll gather back for a question and answer session. Thank you. Hey. Thanks so much, Mina. So just uh, another little housekeeping note um, while we get organised to move into the breakout rooms. So just to flag up that if you have any problems at all in the breakout rooms, you can always message Eileen. Um, you can also leave the breakout room and come back into this main room and one of us will be here, probably Peter, and um, you know we can um, help you through a problem or an issue and chat with you there. Um, You'll get a dialog box come up on your screen. There'll be a choice of join or not now. If you don't want to uh, join the breakout room, you can opt out by saying not now, and that'll keep you in this main room. 
Uh, we do encourage you, though, obviously, though, to join in the breakout rooms. It's a really nice opportunity to have a chat, and it'd be great if everyone can put their camera on. They're just small groups of five people um, that you'll be with. And this section of the event is not being recorded. Give it a minute or so for the system to catch up and everyone to get back in. Hopefully that happens quickly. Yeah, I think like we didn't have enough time. So. Okay, well, we'll go into a kind of um, feeding back from the groups and, um, you know, that can inform question and answer as well. So um, hopefully we can still grapple with some, some aspects. Okay, sure. Yeah, um, we are very short on time. So um, I think rather than just feedback from the groups, I would love to hear some of the, the things that came up for you, but um, we can also combine that with, with the Q&A rather than separating those two segments. Um, so if you um, would like to ask a question or share from the group conversation, um, if you'd like to, to um, vocalize your question or comment, then um, in both cases, please drop your question in the in the chat box and then um, Alison will relay it back to me. But um, do mention if you'd, if you'd like to, to say it um, or have your video on and, and directly address your question. Um, if you have questions. <laughs> Hello? Yes, hi. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm still struggling with Zoom, I'm afraid. Um, if it's all right with the other members of my group, I'd just like to say one or two things that came up. And um, one of them um, was from me. <laughs> uh, I'm much more interested in the political power of love than I am of beauty. Uh, I understand everything Mina has said, and it's just been a joy to hear her and to see the film. It was wonderful. Um, two things instantly came to mind um, while I was listening, uh, both from my student notebooks 40 odd years ago. <laughs> um, one is a quote from um, Emily Dickinson, where she says, uh, that love is all there is, is all we know of love, which I think places it pretty centrally in terms of human experience. And the other is um, the idea that, uh, well, that Anais Nin, Nin uh, proposed, which was that the secret of joy is the mastery of pain. And I was very conscious of that, watching the film and listening to Mina, um, that through that conquering of pain, you actually come into a, um, a position of love and of beauty. Um, and I'm so looking forward to reading, reading your book, Mina, <laughs> uh, Sensuous Knowledge, which I look forward to very much. Anyway, that's all. Well, that was a lot. Thank you so much, Sam. That was a wonderful comment. Um, yeah, it's interesting to try to unpack the difference between love and, and beauty. I mean, I think they're, in, in some sense, they can be very subtle. They can also be quite stark, depending on, on how we define beauty. Um, but something that came to mind as you were speaking was um, Martin Luther King. Um, I'm going to paraphrase, but he, um, he spoke about how um, love without power could become something too, um, too soft almost, um, and power without love becomes too harsh. Um, and so I guess that's where there could be, a, not a failing um, of love, but, but something to question when it comes to placing love rather than beauty at the center. Um, of course, I think we need both, but, um, but, but beauty kind of, um, I feel like if, if, if we look at that in our so social and political movements, it's a little bit more 
concrete. It can even be a bit more pragmatic and like, how do I have a beautiful conversation or a beautiful relationship? Um, whereas love can risk this thing that, that Martin Luther King um, alluded to where without power, it can become even further disempowering. But um, the, the ending of pain quote by Anai, Anais Nin um, is, is wonderful. And I, I think even there, like beauty has a role to play. At least I know when I've gone through um, really painful moments in life, um, uh, beauty, you know, in, in people's gestures, in poetry, in music, in dance, in friendship, in, in those kinds of spaces. And sometimes in the worlds of ideas and uh, that kind of thing as well has been very restorative. Um, so yes, thank you for that. It's a great comment. Great. Um, so we've got a kind of comment and a question from uh, Steve Olin. Um, I'll just read it out if that's okay. Um, so he says, interesting to think of the idea of beauty outside of that golden ratio, since that's been the center or hinge point that has been presented as the basis of an idea of beauty, as though it is a universal which is a selling point, but that might just be advertising, therefore. And then we continue. Uh, so wondering what other constants one would use to define beauty? Is it an inner glow, so it's really beautiful, uh, which may not be recognized by all others? And is it only those who it can be communicated to that are relevant, which would seem a little exclusive? And then um, they also say, and they just saw the new Sam Pollard documentary, MLK slash FBI to speak, which I highly recommend. And does beauty denote anything more than how suitable a mate the beautiful one is supposed to be? Should that be transcended? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> no questions, but... <laughs> no questions, Keep them coming. Um, thanks for the, the recommendation. I, I've been wanting to see that. Um, does beauty... Um, so first of all, with the, the golden ratio and all of those, um, measurements, they, uh, sadly, they're not only about marketing gimmicks, even though uh, in, in our current capitalist climate, um, they lend themselves very well to, for marketing purposes. Um, but these are like serious philosophical conversations that have shaped our, our worldviews, our educational systems, our political systems, um, you know, the greatest sort of philosophers, the, the allegedly greatest philosophers who, I mean, many of, of many Western philosophers have made important contributions. So uh, many Western men, I should say. Um, so I don't mean to dismiss them in any kind of blanket way. Um, but yeah, things like, I can't remember the name of the German, he's a, he was a German philosopher who, um, the, the man who came up with the golden ratio theory. And he rooted that in something that I think it was Aristotle or Plato um, was already talking about. So, you know, these are not just sort of fringe ideas. They've really shaped how society is structured. Um, in terms of an inner glow, um, I actually quite like that, even though I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm arguing that we move away from just the aesthetic and, and look at um, you know, from a feminist perspective, beauty is much more, uh, as I said, it's more socio-political for me, um, the thing that I'm looking for with it. But I also do agree with what you're alluding to, which is, um, I think passion is, uh, is perhaps a metric uh, for beauty, if we must have a metric, which I don't think we must. Um, but, you know, there's something about uh, when a person uh, is passionate about something, there's, you know, it's very, it's very hard to not find that beautiful. Um, and then the last question you had, um, does beauty denote anything more than, I'm not sure I understand this question, how, how suitable a mate? Um, I mean, if, if you're asking whether, no, I'm afraid I don't really <laughs> understand the question. Um, if you don't mind, do, did you get it, Alison, or can, can you repeat it? Um, so they added underneath, I'm just wondering what you triangulate the valorization against. I'm, I'm not quite sure as well, so um, you're welcome to jump in if you like, uh, Steve. But um, Right, um, maybe I'll just, just explain both of those. I'm just like, um, I don't know if that translates. I'm just wondering what you triangulate the valorization against. If you're looking at people like Plato, 
uh, Plato, Aristotle, and whoever the German guy was, as though they are absolutely significant figures whose word is God or whatever, and therefore their opinion on something like, this is what we call beauty, that's what you need to call beauty, um, or if it's just, oh, there's this guy who everybody listened to at one point that everybody's repeated since then, and therefore that's where the value comes from. Um, is the value as significant as has been imbued on it? Also, the uh, the thing about uh, the the mate. The only purpose of you, the only purpose of beauty, is to denote that this is somebody that I want to mate with. This is somebody that I want to have my children, and that's not the only criteria for what beauty should denote. I um, think. Yes, yes, I see what you mean now. Thank you for elaborating. So um, this kind of like beauty is something that's part of human evolution, like it's an evolutionary thing. So um, yes, um, I mean, I, I would place those in similar categories to those that have already been mentioned. So again, it's, it's kind of about measuring beauty and also it's th those evolutionary theories are incredibly tied to patriarchal and white supremacist ideas. Um, you know, there's there's been so many theories over the ages about um, things like, you know, a spe specific type of, well, the hourglass figure, for instance, that, that that is attractive because it signifies to the male that a woman is ready for mating. Um, and of course, you then can tie that to a political agenda of like women are there for men's sort of reproductive aims. And um, yeah, so I, I, I would um, move away from all of those theories, um, looking at what is, you know, what, what in them can, can spark further dialogue. But what, what really matters is to, um, to defy the norms and to redefine beauty, yeah. Um, I, I, we are running behind, but I see that we have uh, another question. So maybe we can yeah. still take that, that last question. I think this is a really great one. So be ashamed to miss. So um, it's just from Dara. So she says, uh, somehow I find that beauty simultaneously suggests a presence, while its absence suggests ugliness or unpleasantness. Do you think it is possible to get over the absence presence aspect? Because more often than not, we perceive beauty or it is linked to perception. In order to imagine it as a verb, we would have to link it to expression or performance or the, the do. How does one do that? How, uh, or can one do that? Hmm. So my found that beauty. Yeah. Um, I think again that we almost don't want to get over the absence presence um, aspect of beauty, um, nor necessarily to um, link it to expression or performance. I think, um, you know, possibly there's something about just uh, stillness, um, beingness, uh, meditativeness, all of those qualities as well. I, 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 I think really the value of beauty is that it can direct us toward becoming comfortable with not knowing. Um, with the unknown. And so, yes, you know, it's very much um, uh, playing with absence and presence. Uh, I really appreciate you bringing that into this conversation um, because even those, even that kind of dichotomy is, it, it alludes to a kind of not knowing, um, you know, and there's something about becoming comfortable with that, which, which, which can be really beautiful. Um, so wherever beauty can uh, help us to just sort of sit together, be together, explore together, um, and kind of have the stance of, uh, look, I don't know what the right thing to do is, and you might not know, um, but let's explore it together. Because so much of our, of our culture, as it has been defined by the conventional dominant systems, is that we always have to have a solution to something. And of course, that solution always has to be based in this kind of uh, things that can be measured and things that can be made into machines and robots and statistics and all of that. And sometimes that's necessary, 
but the thing about having beauty inform our conversations, our dialogues is precisely to just um, explore, you know, rather than to know. And I think the film was, uh, you know, it really shows this, this character is just exploring. There isn't a certitude to her movement, to her gait. Um, it's a bit hesitant. And that's the same way that I feel about beauty as being generative. Thank you for that question though. Um, and thank you once again to everybody who joined. Um, I hope you enjoyed this and I hope that you'll stay in touch. Um, you can check out my, my website, um, which is misafropolitan.com. I think somebody was asking earlier. Um, and of course, continue to follow the, the Cooper Gallery sit-ins. Um, Alison, you might wanna um, say a few words about your upcoming program, but on my, for my part, I just wanna say thanks to everyone for coming tonight. Great. Thanks so much, Minna. It's been um, really a pleasure to have you. So on behalf of Cooper Gallery, just a big thanks to you, Minna, um, for such a stimulating session. And thanks to everyone who's been able to join us and contribute to this event as well. Um, so yeah, we'd, um, we'd really encourage you to have a, a look at um, Minna's other work, the Centre's Knowledge Book, and also the recent um, um, reading list for Cooper Gallery that's our, what I'm reading now, which was also shared in the chat earlier. Um, so for some further reading. Um, yeah, we'd really like to invite you to join us at the next Cooper Gallery event. Um, that's next Thursday um, as part of the Egbin Art School, and that is an optimism class, a jukebox of people trying to uh, change the world. Um, so that's inspired by Ruth, uh, Ruth Ewan's project of the same title. And that's also a fundraiser um, for Optimistic Sounds. That's a Dundee-based charity. So really welcome you to come to that as well. Thanks so much.